Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Malignant Heart, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're getting your brains knocked out and are just hanging on until the gong sounds, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, how do you explain this in a man? At 38, he's retired. A millionaire, yet he steals a trinket from a five and ten cent store, makes sure he's caught, and then merely laughs. He stands aside and lets his own father work as a night watchman. This man is my husband, and I love him for what he was before he came. He's a distinct of evil. of evil during the last year. I must find out what's happening to Walter. Won't you please come out to my home as soon as possible? And it's signed, yours most urgently, Edna Pallister. Oh, you know, Brooksy, sometimes I think Lieutenant Riley is right. Well, you're exceptionally charitable today, George. Well, it does seem that all the characters in the lunatic fringe find their way to us. Yeah, well, I guess we just get all the breaks. But how do you account for a Walter Pallister? How do you account for a Walter Pallister? Well, given a minimum of human curiosity, Brooksy, that's the question we can't pass up. You're an intelligent woman, Mrs. Pallister. It hardly seems necessary to tell you your husband needs a psychiatrist. Do you think I haven't tried that? Well, what happened? At the end of the interview, Walter gave the doctrine inferiority complex. You see, my husband is a very brilliant man. Oh, I'm sure there's another word for him. But as you said in your letter, you love him. For what he used to be, Mr. Valentine. Good and kind. All right, now, okay. You imply there are other incidents, besides the theft in the five and ten and... Being the kind of son that's hardly a comfort to anybody in his old age. Mr. Valentine, I hardly know where to start. Well, when did you first notice this change in your husband, Mrs. Pallister? Well, we're not overly religious. But we used to go to church every Sunday. Yeah? And then for no reason at all, there was that Sunday shortly after he retired. He dropped me off at the church, and then he said loudly so everyone could hear... I'm going to put in a few rounds of golf, and I'll see you later, darling, when you're through with your pagan rituals. Uh -huh. Oh, well, Mrs. Pallister, you might be attaching too much importance to that. He may not have been himself that morning, and a lot of people skip church once in a while. Yes, I know. I only mentioned it because that was the first time I noticed the change in Walter's character. The... Oh, I didn't know you had company, Mrs. Pallister. Well, you could have knocked Lucy. Well, what do you want? I know this is my day off, but I'm taking the afternoon off to go into town and do some shopping. Some personal shopping. Why do you take the trouble to announce it? Apparently, I have nothing to say about it. I well, just thought you'd like to know. If you've got any complaints about me, you can take them to Mr. Pallister. I... I I'm sorry for the interruption, Mr. Valentine. Your, uh, maid? Yes. Yeah. Why don't I fire her? Sure, what's the matter? Is she under contract? Why don't you just bounce her out the front door? I can't. Walter again. How's that? He likes her here. Well, that's a real cozy arrangement. But being slightly feminine myself, you know what I do? Well, I... Oh, sorry, Mrs. Pallister. It's all right. All our friends talk about Walter and Lucy. He made sure they would. But you know, she doesn't really mean anything to him. That's just one more thing I don't understand about him. You know, I'm beginning not to understand him at all. Yes, I know. It's not going to be easy to find a reason for anything my husband's done in the last year. Look, you see this house? Now, this whole estate, for instance. Well, it's very beautiful. It's not very easy living in it. What does that mean? All this used to belong to my husband's partner. It meant everything to him. But Walter decided that he wanted it, and he got it. Even if it meant ruining a man so he'd have to sell it. Well, it seems your husband isn't going to be happy till he becomes Mr. Obnoxious of 1948. Mr. Valentine, there must be an explanation. And I owe it to Walter to find out what's happened. You've got to help me. You know, they don't make them like you very often, Mr. Valentine. I don't know exactly what I can do, but one thing is sure. I'll have to meet Mr. Pallister and talk to him. Where is he? 
probably in the kennels. Down there near the caretaker's cottage. Sometimes it seems to me those vicious dogs are the only thing he cares about these days. I don't mean to be cynical, Mrs. Pallister, but I don't know how to approach your husband. What do I say? You've been a naughty boy, Walter, so come on and tell the nice man why. Just do what you can. Anyway, he's probably expecting you. You can be sure that Lucy was eavesdropping. Oh, well, in that case, Brooksy, I guess we can expect anything. George, I think they're coming after us. Hey, Palace there. Just a minute, we want to talk to you. Go on, get him. His throat, General, that's the boy. Get him off of me. Now you've got him, General. George! George! Oh, you don't. Alistair, if you don't call those hounds off, I'll shoot all three of them. All right, now back. Go on, go on. What have you done to General? He's my best dog. What have I done? Did you hear the man, Brooksy? Oh, never mind that. Are you all right, Doc? Except it feels strange standing around with one sleeve missing. Let me have that gun. Hey, wait a minute. What? Oh. Now, you didn't have to do that, Pallister. The dog wasn't hurt. On the contrary, he was. I believe your name is Valentine. Oh, did Lucy give you my social security number, too? And you wanted to talk to me. I think we'll be much more comfortable back in the library. Mrs. Pallister has been unnerved by all the excitement. I can imagine. I insisted she take a sedative and lie down. Well, is there anything I can get you? Well, you could run out and buy Mr. Valentine a new suit. Okay, okay. That's our quota for small talk. Splendid. Now, oh, uh, Mr. Pallister, I came right over as soon as I got your call. Ah, tell me, Haggerty. Miss Brooks, Valentine, I'd like you to meet the gentleman who keeps the peace in our little village. Chief Haggerty. All right. Where is this fellow you was telling me about? Uh-huh. I think he means me, Chief. Okay, Pallister, what's the payoff this time? Haggerty, although there's a sign down at the gate that distinctly says no trespassing and beware of dogs, this man invaded my property and deliberately killed one of my best hounds. And this man is a diamond-studded liar. Now, now, young lady, there's no call for language like that. You'll find two bullets missing from his gun, Haggerty. It was a wanton killing of a defenseless creature. Oh, I don't know. I let him bite me first. What charges do you want to make against Mr. Pallister? Now, according to the book... Well, you know I'm generous to a fault, Chief. I just don't like to see the law flout. How about a small fine? Anything you say, Mr. Pallister. That'll be $25, young fellow. Now, wait a minute. Look. Oh. And you can pay up right now, because I'm the justice of the peace around here, too. Okay. Okay. Well, now I've seen everything. If he gives you any more trouble, Mr. Pallister, you let me know. I'll really make it tough for him. You and Napoleon, eh, Walter? Oh, Valentine, don't look so grim. <laughs> that was beautiful. Oh, can't you appreciate it? All right. Here's your $25. If you don't do something about him, George, I'm going to turn into a great big tomboy. Are you through enjoying yourself, Pallister? <laughs> don't you see, Valentine? As the law would say, I perjured myself against you, and I got the biggest laugh I've had in a long time. And why? Go on. My wife hired you to delve into the aberrations of my twisted psyche. Well, I wanted to give you something to think about. I suppose you've had enough now? Uh-uh. The only reason I let you have your fun is that I've decided to go to work for Mrs. Pallister. Even though I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Fine, fine. You mean you don't mind? On the contrary. I'm intrigued with the possibility. In fact, I insist that you stay right on here as our guests. In fact, I wouldn't think of refusing such hospitality. Very well. Come along, Valentine. I'll let you have one of my suits. Oh. I believe Lucy is back now. She'll show you to your room, Miss Brooks. Oh, thanks. I think I'd feel a lot safer if I found it myself. Then we can get together here in the library again and go on with this fascinating inquiry as to why I'm such an unholy brute. Oh, it's going to be 
be down in a minute. Please, listen. You and Miss Brooks must leave. You've got to. Hey, wait a minute. Why the turnabout, Mrs. Pallister? I should think you'd need us here. Look, he's capable of anything. After what happened today, I realize I have no right to ask anybody to share this with me. He might have been killed. And if I assure you, we can take care of ourselves? You don't know him. He's so diabolically clever. I'll just have to make up my mind to leave him. Well, frankly, I can think of harder decisions to make. Now, you must go. I think he's planning something right now. Edna. Walter. Go upstairs this moment and bathe your eyes. You're hardly an appetizing sight, my dear, as a hostess. Well, I... Uh, I was I only... said go upstairs. Walter. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, Let her go, Pallister. Or I'll have to take this little game off the drawing room level. Oh, sorry. Now, darling, will you go and see about dinner? Well, did you have a chance to look around? Did you notice this little Hindu idol in the corner, for instance? The ugliest thing I've ever seen. It's been a constant source of inspiration to me. Those tentacles, you see, are the forces of evil reaching out, claiming everything. Uh-huh. A big button? Oh, uh, nothing. You know, Valentine, it was a melancholy thought to find out that at 38... I'd been successful, vastly successful, at everything I put my mind to. Poor you. Oh, you're quite right. All the zest, the challenge, is gone. <laughs> I can understand the fits of depression Alexander the Great had when he found out he'd conquered the world and there was nothing else left. Well, would it be impolite if I said I was hungry? Forgive me, Miss Brooks. I'll see what the delay is. Oh, boy. Well, if he isn't mad, what's the pattern for all this? Hmm? Well, whatever Palace has got must be contagious. What are you mumbling about? Look, see, he isn't going about this haphazardly. He's got a goal. There's a method, a pattern. Oh, George, he's the grown-up edition of the kid next door who used to tear the wings off butterflies. Uh uh-uh, nothing so simple, Angel. But how about this for a weird notion? Buster's out to break every law, man-made or moral, if he can think of one by one and with great fanfare. He prefers having somebody know what he's doing so he can get a real kick out of getting away with it. Well, it's a weirdy, all right, but I don't understand it. Pallister is not just a pex bad boy. He imagines himself an undersized Superman. He stole from the five and ten, and the Pallister name saved him from any embarrassment. All right. All right, he wanted this estate, so he ruined his partner to get it. He turned the dogs on us, and I paid a fine. Yeah. Yeah, and look what he's doing to his father. Yeah, Brooksy, every decency, one by one. That be knighted character thinks that's the one way he can really prove his power. Yeah, but even so, uh, I don't see what we can do to help poor Mrs. Pallister. Folks, see, we've got to do something. What do you mean, George? A man like Pallister never stops till he brings things to a logical conclusion. And you can see him driving toward it now. Huh? I told you, Brooksy, he's out to break every law. And I don't think he'll be satisfied until he's committed murder. Turn to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, if your car misbehaves in city traffic, acts like it had about as much get up and go as a snail, there are two things you can do. One, you can just steel yourself to impatient horns and stony stairs. But a happier way out is the second one. Just switch to Chevron Supreme gasoline. For special blending agents in this premium quality gasoline, a sure speedy pickup in stop-and-go traffic. And they give your car all the go-ahead it needs when the lights flash green. Chevron Supreme's blended, too, for that extra power your car needs on hills. Another thing, it's climate-tailored to bring out your car's pep and power in each different altitude and temperature zone. So wherever you go in the West, rely on Chevron Supreme for smoother performance. Independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations are proud to offer you this great premium quality gasoline. No wonder they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Walter Pallister... A success at everything he touches has focused his dark, brooding mind on what he considers the supreme proof of his power. He's determined to deliberately break every law and get away with it. 
So far, only George and Brooksy have succeeded in guessing what he's doing, and you can't help feeling that he won't rest until he's committed murder, all of which doesn't make breakfast at the Pallister home a very festive occasion. Let's see, Valentine. You and Miss Brooks have been with us more than 12 hours now. I'm afraid it's been very dull. Oh, I can remember more boring occasions. For instance, the time I got my hand caught in a meat grinder. Walter, won't you finish your coffee? Please, Edna. Since everyone is so glum, Miss Brooks, let's see if I can make you laugh. Well, the only place I'm ticklish is on the bottom of my feet. A droll thought just occurred to me. Imagine the noble Sir Galahad going out to slay the fire-breathing dragon and suddenly finding himself... With a rubber spear. <laughs> you ought to know what I mean, Valentine. Ha ha. Very funny. I think all of us have finished. Why don't we Wait, all... Wait, I have an idea how to liven up things. Why don't we all pack up and go up to my lodge in Wisconsin for a couple of days? Skiing, a little shooting. Oh, Lucy, come on in here. Walter, this really isn't the time. Your husband seems to have made up his mind, Mrs. Pallister, so there couldn't be a better time. Did you call me Walt? Uh... Mr. Pallister? Get upstairs and start packing. We're going on a little vacation. And you're coming along too, Lucy. Oh, I just know we'll have loads of fun. Go on, Edna. Why don't you go along with Mrs. Pallister, Brooksy? Okay, George. Maybe she can tell me where I can dig up a pair of red flannels. Uh, tell me, friend. What is it you can do on the snowy slopes of Wisconsin that you can't do in this house? Just a notion. I haven't been up to the lodge in two years. You know, the last time I was up there, I brought down a running rabbit at 100 yards with a 22. That's perfect shooting. Shut now, up, Collister. Do I get on your nerves? Which one of us is it going to be? Have you decided? What are you talking about? Aren't you about ready to decide that you're big enough to get away with murder? Ah, well, what do you know? I guess I've underrated you, Valentine. But you won't get away with it, Pallister. So finally I've met someone with perception enough to see the reasoning behind my little game. Heaven knows I've given enough clues. I made it obvious what I was doing. You know, there's never yet been a Superman who hasn't stubbed his toe trying to do what you're doing. Which makes the game all the more exhilarating. Yes. Especially now that you know that you can't do anything about it. You sure? If you went to the police, they'd laugh at you. <laughs> Of course, the simplest thing you could do would be to uh, bow out of the picture. Oh, no, no. That might deprive you of some of that exhilaration you were talking about. The appreciative audience. Good. Then you'd better run along and pack, too. Oh, Valentine. Yeah? Don't forget to include your rubber spear. Think of Lucy, everybody. She's beginning to ski like a champion. Oh, and only in three days, mind you. Oh, I knew this was going to be loads of fun. I'm doing pretty well myself. Only three days and I can stand up on these things. Oh, that's funny, Brooksy. That's never the way I find you. Miss Brooks hasn't had the advantage of Walter's undivided attention. Come on, Lucy. Before we leave, you're going to be able to ski down the whole north run right from the top of the hill to the road. You really think I could, Walter? I'd better go in and see about lunch. It's obvious Lucy isn't going to have time to prepare it. Well, I'll be in in a minute to help you, Mrs. Tallister. Oh, George, be a good guy and kiss me, will you? Oh, no fair if I have to be good. Mm, thanks. Now, would you mind saying something funny? Now, what's the matter? Ain't you scared? You bet I'm scared. Man gives me the willies. He's like a shadow on us all the time. Yeah, he makes me feel like a boy scout, and I don't like it. But there's nothing I can do. He probably has it all planned. It could be any one of us. Yeah depending on which one suits his vanity. Hmm. Have you had even a small guess what he's up to? No, oh, Brooksy, I can't follow Pallister around like a bloodhound. All I can do is keep my eyes open and try to keep one step ahead of him. It's horrible to think he might be able to kill and get away with it, just the way he has with everything else. I'm not worried now about his getting away with it, but how to keep him from committing murder. <laughs> Can't stop me, Mr. Valentine. We're leaving in a half hour, and I'm going to make that north run down the hill. 
know. I'm not going to let you do it, Lucy. What right of you to tell me what to do? Now, Lucy, Valentine may be right. It is a little dangerous. I don't care. I'm going to do it. I'll show you how good I am, Walter. Just watch me. Do we have to stand here in the road all day? What's the matter with that girl? Why doesn't she stop? Don't be impatient, my dear. Have we got everything in the station wagon? Oh, come to think of it, we left all the skis down by the mailbox. I'll be right back. I see Lucy up there now. It's about time. Here she comes. Oh, look at her. She's really showing off, isn't she? Oh, golly. Oh, George, you've got to admit she's pretty good. Look at her pick up speed. Yeah. Well, anyway, she got by the first turn. Well, now all she has to do is make that last turn around the tree, and it'll be easy going down the road. Yeah, yeah, that's all she's got to do. Oh, oh, nothing's happened. She's losing her balance. Watch the tree. Oh, no. Come on, let's get up there. Oh. Not that it'll do any good. Oh, it's horrible. She smashed right into the tree. Oh, oh George. Really cool. oh. Why didn't she listen to us, Valentine? You knew she wouldn't listen, Valentine. You had her all hopped up about making that run. You know that one slip taking that turn and Lucy would be a jigsaw puzzle for the undertaker. It was an accident. As much of an accident as this. Mr. Valentine, don't. I no. hope that made you feel better, Sir Galahad. But it doesn't change the fact that it was an accident. Well, sorry to take so long getting back here from the mortuary, but I don't think I'll have to detain you folks much longer here. We're hardly worried about that at a time like this, Sheriff. And the coroner just had to take one look at the poor girl. It was too bad. And that's that, eh, Sheriff? You're just right, like Mr. Valentine. Now, if, uh, if you people will just sign this paper as witnesses to the accident, they will satisfy the state of Minnesota and they will satisfy me. Uh, here, Mr. Spallister, if uh, if you will be kind enough. Yes. Oh, Sheriff. Yes, sir. You said the coroner just had to take one look at Lucy. Sure, that's what I said. I'm sure he's not too busy to take a second look with me. I'll have my fingers crossed till you get back, George. Till you get back? Why, we were just sitting here waiting to leave. Sorry, Superman. You'll just have to go on sitting and wait. <laughs> It was a natural mistake, Mr. Valentine. After what happened, I just assumed Don't that... take it too hard, coroner. At first, I assumed the same thing, too. Why did you want me to stop by the mailbox, Valentine? Nobody's leaving any mail this time of day. What I'm looking for, Sheriff, was left much earlier. Yeah, but it's got to be around here in the snow somewhere, Sheriff. No, oh, this is a mighty lot of snow... Eight. Yeah. Look you here. That's it, a high powered twenty-two. I can't believe it. You, you mean You're it. talking about a man who's perfect at everything. He can bring a running rabbit down at a hundred yards. All right, all right. Since you all seem so incredulous, I'll skip right down to the words of one syllable department. Doesn't matter. Walter, I won't believe it. You couldn't have done it. Thank you, Edna. There you are, Valentine. I'm vindicated. I should have known you wouldn't leave anything to chance, Pallister. When Lucy was about to make that ski run, you went down the road to pick up the skis you planted there previously. Wouldn't that be rather hard to prove? Around the curve of the road, we couldn't see you. But you were there, all right, this rifle in hand. You had a bead on Lucy every second. When she came to that curve by the tree, you let her have it. But, George, we didn't hear a shot. A silencer took care of that. And a telescopic sight brought Lucy as close as a floating duck in a shooting gallery. Walter, why? Walter, why? You wouldn't understand, my dear, even if I told you. The whole magnificent concept would be too big for your mind. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, it doesn't matter, Sheriff. Only the facts matter now. Pallister, you kill Lucy Irwin with a malignant and abandoned heart, as it states so beautifully in a murder indictment. Yes. And another fact... You're going to pay for it with your life. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, he laughed. Walter! Oh, that's where you're wrong, Valentine. I'm not going to be destroyed, as threatened when you flout all your precious conventions. I'm going to go right on living, even though it may be in jail for a while. Oh, how do you figure that? Why, didn't you know? 
There's no capital punishment in the state of Wisconsin. Oh, you're so right, Pallister, as always. But you're in the sovereign state of Minnesota. Or didn't you hear the sheriff say that before? What? What What did you say? Explain it to him, Sheriff, as you explained it to me. Well, uh, folks have been disputing this little corner of the state for, for years now. We had a special referendum last election. We decided we want to be in Minnesota. You're lying. Oh, you're making all this up. You can't. And in Minnesota, Pallister, they have capital punishment. Oh, golly, it's good to get back to the office. I don't think I'll ever get warm again. <laughs> You'll thaw out, Angel. You'll thaw out. <laughs> so let's get busy and see what mail's piled up, huh? Okay. Hmm. Hey, what is this? Sarcasm? Hmm, what do you mean? A circular. Look. Spend your honeymoon in Paradise Valley. Have fun in this winter wonderland. Oh. Skiing, ice skating, tobogganing. Oh, no. Oh, no honeymoon? Well, I'd rather skip the honeymoon if it means winter sport. Hey, you know, back in New England, there used to be a winter sport called bundling. Highly recommended. Oh, darling, you're wonderful. Hmm? Well, if that's the case, we could even go to the North Pole. If you're looking for ways to cut corners that will make your budget go further, listen to this. It's a statement by Mr. O.C. Blackburn of Van Nuys, California, who uses compounded RPM motor oil in his car. He says, quote, I use RPM for economy. RPM, I know, reduces wear, lengthens engine life, and lowers repair cost on my car, unquote. And like thousands of other Western motorists, you'll find you can make car operation a more thrifty deal when you rely on RPM motor oil. How does RPM do it? By fighting off your car's worst enemy, internal engine rust, by stopping carbon trouble, and by clinging to internal engine hot spots left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary motor oils. So for real economy, why not start tomorrow? Get a crankcase drain and a refill with RPM motor oil. Get it at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll find George studying a new letter that has just reached him. Dear Mr. Valentine, a man should be able to do anything to hold the woman he loves. But I'm not strong enough. I need your help desperately. I shall be at your office in the morning to tell you the whole story. Yours truly, Bruno Terrell. Next week, a new case for George. The Fabulous Fatso. adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California. On behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. 